Hey friends, this is Mark Sarovic, host of the Workplace Solutions Podcast, inviting you to discover the joy of work. All right, we're good. How you doing today, Dub? I'm doing well, thanks. I hope you are. Oh, I am. I am. It is a gorgeous day outside. Indeed. And I like the coolness. They say we're going to get some really cold weather. Eh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but I like it anyway. I haven't been on my hammock in a while, so that was that was nice. Yeah, I noticed. It just surprised me when I drove up. <laughs> I thought I'd hear this voice, and I wasn't sure where it was coming from. <laughs> if I really wanted to surprise you, I would have jumped out of the bushes. So <laughs> That's true. You would have. <laughs> I, I, had, I actually had a roommate in grad school where I would do that. I would hide behind the door when I knew he was coming home. Because he, he just frightened really easily. And as an adult, I realized that was really mean. But 23-year-old but, but Mark <laughs> thought it was hilarious. Of course he did. So I would just jump out. And he would, you may still think he would, it's hilarious, but uh, you may restrain yourself. Yes. I think you're right there, Dub. <laughs> okay. Good. Thought I had a oh, pulse. Love it. Love it. All right. I am here today with Dr. Robert H. Dub. Darville the third, who is an accounting professor, PhD, CPA, and has led in a bunch of different contexts from academic leadership, church leadership, business, does consulting, and a lot of things. So excited that you're here today, Dub. Yeah, go ahead and introduce yourself. As Mark said, I go by Dub. If you were to call me Robert, I would not know of whom you're speaking. My students, however, don't get the privilege of calling me Dub. Do they say Dr. Darville? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And if they say anything else, (laughs) they only do it once. But I'm just kidding. Yeah, formality has its place, but oftentimes it seems to be a hindrance more than anything else. But at any rate, I've been in Rome since June 1985, teaching at Shorter College, now University. Uh, I've done some adjunct teaching at Barry over the years as well, and several other places. I came to Shorter from a church administrator position and just came in as a assistant professor. Over time, was named a department chair, a division chair, then got my doctorate at Georgia State, and then the college reorganized in a university framework. We created schools or colleges and I was named dean of the College of Business. And uh, I have theoretically <laughs> retired-ish, yeah, about two and a half years ago. This coming May will be three years. But I am not a stay-at-home, do-nothing retiree. Mm-hmm. And so I offered uh, to go back to Shorter as a visiting professor, and they graciously took me on again. And it's been fun. No expectations regaring Mm -hmm. hiring, firing, putting Mm -hmm. out fires. You've had your season of making decisions. Indeed, I have. I'm done. I'm done, I think. But anyway, it's been fun to go back and just teach. Mm -hmm. And I teach online for a couple of other places, and I find that I'm actually busier (laughs) in my retired status than I ever was, actually. But it's a fun sort of busy. Good. I'm excited to hear that. And I've seen you thriving in this post-retirement world. So that's a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and do an icebreaker question that I I have not prepared Dub for. (laughs) This one shouldn't be too bad. Dub, what is your favorite college mascot that is not orange? (laughs) <laughs> More, you're like what's one that you find interesting so not necessarily your favorite team not my favorite you can mention the university of tennessee if you want yeah i am a tennessee fan mm-hmm. was not until i got married mm-hmm. and my wife's family is all from east tennessee and that's not what really did it for me mm-hmm. what did it was our son at the age of eight <laughs> informed me that he was going to play college football for philip fulmer mm. okay And so we became UT fans, and indeed he did. He went up. He was a true walk-on, just walked in, I want to play. And they gave him a locker number, and he was a letterman by the time he left. So, yeah, we're Tennessee fans. Others that I graduated from Mississippi State with Mm -hmm. my master's, and so I'm a little partial to Mm. maroon Mm. bulldogs. Okay. Not red ones. (laughs) Maroon. So I'll go ahead and answer my question, which is the University of St. Louis, the Billiken. And you might be wondering, what is a Billiken? Uh, That thought did cross my mind. And 
when I heard of a Billiken, I immediately assumed it was a cross between a billy goat and a pelican. <laughs> and it's not, <laughs> which took some of the fun out of it. But apparently a Billiken is a gnome-like magical creature that their football coach, I think in the 20s, I will have to fact check the, the history on this, mm-hmm. looked like the classic, think like troll doll, but without hair. And so their, their coach apparently looked like this Billiken, and so they ended up naming the team after that. But I think just it's a very unique mascot Indeed. That, that no one else has. So I find that, because there's a lot of wildcats and bears and, and uh, dogs. True. And My son, for about five years, worked for the University of Maryland, mm-hmm. who are the Terrapins. Mm-hmm. Odd name for a football team that's mm-hmm. supposed to be fast. <laughs> Turtles are not known for swiftness, but nevertheless, that is an amusing one to me. So let's hope we didn't alienate half of our audience. No, <laughs> probably not. Probably not. You've, you've referenced him a couple times. You want to give Stephen a shout out? Hello, Stephen. How are you? He is now working for Boston College in their athletic department, and so... I hope you've learned from the mistakes of your dad as you (laughs) find yourself in a leadership position. Oh, man. Love it. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into today's topic. We're going to do lessons for leaders. So Dub has had different leadership roles in different environments for 43 years. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this... I'll probably embarrass you a little bit with this one. (laughs) I went through your resume and I counted the bullet points of accomplishments and service things that you've done, not even including just the classes you taught, but all of your accomplishments and professional Mm -hmm. activities. What do you think the the number was? I have absolutely no idea. 139. Wow. (laughs) That sounds a little pompous and I didn't mean it. (laughs) And I know you didn't, which is why I brought it up. So (laughs) Okay, good, good. No, but Dub has accomplished a lot of things, has a ton of experience. And so we're going to just tap into some of that as we go through this conversation about lessons for leaders. Sound good? good? Yes. Okay. So let's start with one you've you've probably thought about a lot. What is your definition of leadership or if you want to share a favorite leadership quote? Yeah, that really is quite difficult. You look at and read research out of the management world and a couple of others. And they give all sorts of definitions of what a leader is or leadership is and that sort of thing. And so I really can't tell you that I have a definition. What I can tell you is leaders do not have to be in a leadership role. Okay. Authority, position, responsibility, are not necessary qualifications or characteristics for a leader. I do believe every leader needs to be uh, a person of vision. You can say you're a leader and you may be going somewhere. Mm -hmm. The question is where? Mm -hmm. And the second question is how do you get there from here? And I've noticed over the years a lot of leaders have an idea of where they want to go and whether that comes from themselves or whether that comes from a board of directors or a board of trustees or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You can head in that direction, but if you don't take stock of where you are and how the institution got to that point, anything you do beyond that is going to be very difficult Mm -hmm. for you. So I would say vision would be incredible, taking Mm -hmm. stock of where you are. And I think remembering leadership does not indicate that you have to get there tomorrow. Hmm. It is a very long haul approach to a destination. Given the rapidness with which our world is changing, the where you think you're going, (laughs) that could change in three days, depending upon your industry or whatever the case may be. And certainly, people moving into and out of your your framework, that is going to change the dynamics as well. So I can't tell you a definitive, this Mm -hmm. is a leader. Sometimes you just observe that person is leading. Hmm. They have a very clear idea of where they are coming from Mm -hmm. and where they are going to. But I think also, just because you're in a leader or leadership role, you might want to look behind you 
to see is anybody actually following? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that, I think that does play in. So, You're only a leader for these people back there. <laughs> correct. The, the question boat. would be, who might yeah. you be leading? You may lead yourself to mm-hmm. something, and and that's fine and, and well and good, and, mm-hmm. and you probably should. But you cannot lead anybody where you've never been. Hmm. Number one, you need to have some framework mm-hmm. of experience in terms of where you're going, but also viewing it always with open handedness, mm-hmm. open eyes, receptivity to new ideas that come along. There's always more than one way to get there. I think that's I think that's important. And the reason I say the following part is I, I have worked in a variety of places where the leader, Mm -hmm. that is the one in in Mm -hmm. charge or in that role, knew where they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And they had a fairly good idea of where they were. Mm -hmm. What they did not do is learn how to motivate those under Mm -hmm. them in such a way that those under them had absolute Mm buy-in and said, yes, we're ready to go. And that is one observation. The second observation about that is that there may have been people following, Mm -hmm. but they were only following because it was their job. Hmm. Their heart was not in it. Hmm. And so I think uh, the leader needs to be one who can motivate Mm -hmm. others, but one who also deeply cares about others and where they are and understanding that everybody comes to the table with something, and it could be good or bad. Mm-hmm. Personally, I think if the leader is worth his or her grain of salt, uh, they're going to take stock not only of where they are, but with whom are they working. Mm. And what are the things that seem to motivate those under them? What are the things that bother those under them? I, I think if you don't do that, I'm not sure that you're really... Hmm. a good <laughs> or an effective leader. Hmm. That's good. Is it all right if I share a definition that I'm working sure. on? Okay. Absolutely. So I would answer this question or workplace solutions would answer this question. Leadership exists for two reasons, to serve the purpose and the people. So the purpose, so why does this company or team, nonprofit, family, et cetera, exist? So the organization, why does it exist? What are we trying to accomplish that is greater than ourselves? A leader serves sacrificially towards that end, but the leader also serves the people. They care about the people entrusted to them. So they seek to walk beside, nurture, grow, support, mentor, train, discipline, etc. Those people on the journey. And that also includes the people outside of the organization Because you want to be asking yourself, how does what you do make the world better, cleaner, happier, more loving? So I think that's, in my mind, that's the the two things that stick out is that you serve the purpose, kind of the reason, the Mm -hmm. why, and the people that that are there. And I would agree with you. You were much more succinct. (laughs) I'm surprised, surprised, right? (laughs) You were much more succinct than I. I like to give lots of examples, mainly because I want people to, at some level, draw their own conclusion Mm. from what I'm sharing. Because I could, as a professor, I can give a definition, Mm. and I would expect that definition back on a test. That goes only so far as the test. Mm. What happens beyond that Mm. and outside, I have found people... Yeah, they like a definition, but what they want is show me what this means or help me attach to a situation. And you're right. And in particularly in the business field, um, the old saying, you can build a better mousetrap and they'll all run, that's a bunch of bull. I, that's not exactly <laughs> true because not everybody may need a mousetrap. Mm. They may, they just may not. Mm-hmm. And from the marketing management financial piece within the business world, it is always important to know who are your customers. Mm. What is it that the customer wants? And are you in a position to be able to supply that? Which actually speaks to your definition Mm -hmm. of taking note of those outside of the organization, making the world a better place, and, and all of those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of overlap. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think that is true, whether it's uh, 
business or education. I don't think I don't think that's peculiar to any one particular sector of society. So, yes, I would add to what I said mm-hmm. succinctly. I might <laughs> add <clears throat> that if you do this without concern for the effect of your leadership decisions on those mm-hmm. outside, but how does it affect those who are just tangentially connected in mm-hmm. some way. And, and if it does not encourage, build, support, make things better, then the question I have to ask is why mm. are we doing this? Mm. So That's good. All right. So, Dub, you've been a leader in several different contexts, academic and university, church and nonprofit, business. What is different between being a leader at the in the university system versus the nonprofit versus business. We'll okay. start there. Sure. Probably the biggest difference, if you want to look at not for profits or nonprofits, mm-hmm. I think it's important to define uh, what kind of a nonprofit, because mm-hmm. there are not for profits or nonprofits who do employ people who are paid wages, mm-hmm. but there are also nonprofits that rely completely mm-hmm. on volunteers. Mm-hmm. And so managing volunteers, mm. <laughs> um, we could talk for eons about that. Well, we'll have you back for another episode. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. And we'll start with the academic world, because that's where I have spent virtually my entire career since 1976. And I look at, in the classroom, I am the leader. Mm-hmm. And I am charged with informing a group of students about things that typically they don't have a clue about. <laughs> we hope that they have one at the end. And, and I think there, how I teach now mm-hmm. is very different from how I started teaching in 1976 at the age of 23 <laughs> at Columbus State University. Understanding where the students are, mm-hmm. what do they come to college with or without, mm. I can't teach now the same way I did then. Can you give an example of what you're doing now that's different then? I'm trying to figure out even a way to tweak this <laughs> because it, it works, but it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. For example, when I first started teaching, there was no such thing as a computer mm-hmm. in terms of personal. Mm-hmm. The only computers I knew of occupied an entire room. Mm-hmm. No such thing as cell phones. <laughs> Those things only showed up on the Jetsons. But most of what we did in the classroom and for homework was pencil and paper, Mm -hmm. which required students to actually listen Mm -hmm. and think and mimic and then do. Mm. I have to find ways to communicate with them in their, I'm going to use the word language, although Mm -hmm. that's not exactly Mm -hmm. correct, but how do they hear? How do they Mm. listen? And then I have to tweak how I say things to them. And so Mm. what I have found now in the old days I could lecture because they all took notes. Mm. Now I teach totally by example. Mm. Here's the topic. Let's take a look at this. Mm -hmm. And so I put it on the board, encouraging them to take notes because they are very visual. Mm -hmm. Plus, there was no such thing as online. And that presents its own challenges. But still delivering content, delivering the instruction, but in just in a different way. I don't see them. Mm -hmm. I don't know them. They do not know me. But having to be there at some level to say, if you're having a problem, let me know. Mm -hmm. So the onus has to be on them. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the classroom, I can look at them and tell it's a deer in headlights and all I hear (laughs) is crickets. That's a pretty good clue. Can't do that in an online sort of Mm -hmm. environment. And I think there are some students who get to college Mm -hmm. and they probably are smart enough to do it. It's just that's not their heart. That's Mm -hmm. not what they want to do. So making them or providing opportunities for them to discover what is it that Mm -hmm. they really want to do. And if that's not college, giving them enough confidence that, you know what, that's okay. Mm -hmm. And making sure parents understand that's okay. Okay. So that's the academic world. Okay. So Uh, let's talk about church leadership or nonprofits. Really? (laughs) Do we have to? (laughs) No. No, no. (laughs) You have permission to not answer the question. I think when it comes to church or not for profit, I want to split those two. Okay. Uh, So let's talk about not for profits. So you got Red Cross, American Heart Association, you've got 
Oh, well, colleges and universities are not for profits. Mm -hmm. And I think some people have the misunderstanding that means they don't want to make a profit. Mm -hmm. Well, it means they don't exist Mm -hmm. for the sole purpose of making a profit. Mm -hmm. They exist to provide a service to whomever. Mm -hmm. And so they have to charge, if you will, above whatever their costs are in Mm -hmm. order to give them enough to continue reinvest. And there are lots of internal revenue rules Mm -hmm. about how much you can and Mm -hmm. cannot and all of that. Tax, don't ask me a tax (laughs) question. That's not my world. Uh, I'm glad we're not talking about accounting for for this Absolutely, absolutely. But in a lot of those organizations, the people who work there are paid employees. Okay. And so to some degree, there's not a lot of difference between that and academia or business world because everybody's getting a check. Mm. I think the difference comes in that the people that are employed in a not-for-profit need to have some level of Mm buy-in. It can't be job because there's too much interaction with people on levels that has nothing to do with an income outcome, so to speak. So that's one thing. I think when you move over into the not-for-profit world of churches, Mm -hmm. the only people typically that are paid, pastor, ministerial staff, janitors, maintenance people, but everybody else that works in that organization, they're volunteers, and they vote with their feet. Mm. And so... How you manage them and lead them, very, very, very different. When I was a church administrator in Florida before I came to Shorter, I had a financial secretary, and then there was the other ministerial staff and secretaries, janitors, maintenance staff, and then we had a church preschool, and they all got paychecks. And so at that level, there still has to be this focused, concentrated notion of I am here for the betterment of whomever. And Mm. whether that's at a spiritual level or an educational level, that has to be recognized. Mm. But when it comes to Sunday school teachers, committee people, and others who are involved in various capacities within the church, Mm -hmm. determining who is critical. And coming into a church, for example, you have no idea who anyone is. And when so, you say determining who, you're talking about putting the right people in the right seats on the bus? Yeah. Okay. And I love that expression. Mm-hmm. Here's the bigger question. Mm-hmm. Are you on the right bus? <laughs> <laughs> we focus on the seat yeah. on the mm-hmm. bus, but that assumes mm-hmm. that you're on the right bus to start with. And, and I will. This is and this is a true story, not about mm-hmm. that, but Stephen, our son, flew to visit his sister, Sarah. It was a 12-hour non-stop flight Mm -hmm. uh, from Atlanta. So he flies. I get a phone call at, oh, I don't know, it must have been one in the morning, or and it's Stephen on the other end. And I'm assuming he's arrived Mm -hmm. and everything is well. Indeed, he had arrived, but the embassy that issued the visa put the wrong entry date (laughs) <laughs> on his visa. Oh, no. <laughs> so he's on one side of the wall with two suitcases, one of his and one for Sarah, packed with goodies. Mm-hmm. She's on the other side of the wall, and they won't let him talk to her <laughs> or see her or anything else. They're trying to communicate via mm-hmm. phones. Mm-hmm. Sarah's crying. She's hysterical. She doesn't know what to do. And so anyway, long story short, he has to get back on the plane And come back to it (laughs) all in the same day. So he finally uh, gets onto the plane, sits down, and this man shows up and he Mm -hmm. says, I think you're in my seat. And Stephen said, no, this it's seat, whatever. Mm -hmm. And turns out they both Mm -hmm. had the same seat. (laughs) However, the personnel at the airports, Mm -hmm. had put Stephen on the wrong plane, (laughs) but he was in the right seat on the plane. (laughs) Now, the good... (laughs) Yes. I'm just laughing because I know he's in Boston right now. He's not stuck in... But here he is, 12, 13 hours post-leaving Atlanta, knowing he's got 12 hours to come back, Mm -hmm. no sleep, no rest, no Mm -hmm. nothing... And so they go and inform the stewardess, oh, 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 that's the next plane. 
<laughs> they're shutting the door. <laughs> and so, that, it's long story short, I got on the plane. So it's not necessarily being in the right seat on the plane, the bus, or whatever. <laughs> it is making sure you're on the right bus. So, I, and I think that's something we just automatically assume. That's not always true. And in my experience, mm. I have gotten on a bus, a job, and mm-hmm. we'll leave it at that, a job that I liked the job. But the organizational structure, mm. the bus, mm-hmm. operated a little contrary mm-hmm. to what I thought or had assumed or knew to be true. So then mm. I had to make a decision. Mm. We're both headed in terms of providing an education for the students. Mm-hmm. They're wanting to achieve it one way. I wasn't completely aware of what that way mm-hmm. was. Mm-hmm. So that I had to make a decision can I stay on this bus in this particular seat and be okay? Ultimately, I could not. And it mm-hmm. was not a bad situation. Mm-hmm. The, the people that I worked with, we all got along great. The head of that particular organization literally mm-hmm. begged me to stay. The bus was a fine bus. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't the bus I thought I was going to be on. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when you come in, you've got people that you don't know who may have been in a role for 20 years in the Mm -hmm. church. And so you make an assumption that person actually fits that role quite well. They might. But when you begin to explain your vision, you may be at cross purposes. Mm. And so trying to figure out, can you work with that person? Mm -hmm. Can that person work with you? What does this mean for us? And not making rash judgments and Mm -hmm. rash decisions. So there's a lot more thinking Mm. and a lot more evaluation Mm. and observation in working in a nonprofit, such as a church where the vast majority of people you deal with, they're there just because. Mm -hmm. They are volunteers. So your Sunday school teachers leave. Your committee chair saying... I ain't doing this. You can't run the whole show. Mm -hmm. So it's a time for you to evaluate. Are you really, are you doing this correctly? And I will give you an example of the church that I went to in Florida. Great people. But as an accountant and a business person coming in, there were certain things that were not in place Mm -hmm. that needed to be. Mm -hmm. just from a Mm safekeeping point of view. And so trying to make those changes, and you get a little bit of a pushback. Mm -hmm. We haven't done it that way. (laughs) I know, and that might be the reason X is happening. When I hear we haven't done it that way, I just want to bash my head. Yes, (laughs) that phrase, and take you to the next level. I don't Mm -hmm. care if I ever hear those two terms ever again. (laughs) But what I found was, for me, it was common sense to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. For them, it was not. And so it took time of explaining why. Mm. So getting buy-in from them, and that's not an instantaneous deal necessarily. So leading them requires me getting out of my comfort zone Mm -hmm. and getting over into their world and trying to explain it to them. And I think one of the things that I learned is it is not about you, meaning (laughs) me. Mm. You can be a leader, but if you don't really demonstrate care and concern for others, the only thing you care about is your paycheck, your bonus, are you getting the recognition, blah, 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 blah. I would say you're not a very good leader. I'm sure, I am quite sure there were times over my various careers that I exhibited that sort of uh personality trait. Mm. And for those times, I'm deeply sorry. And I've even had to go back to people and say, I'm totally messed up here. I'm really sorry about that. But I have worked for others who made gross mistakes, who to this day have yet to admit that they ever made a mistake. Yeah, and, and I'm not talking, they didn't steal money. Yeah. It wasn't an illegal thing. Yeah. No, about that. But, and so I I hope this answers the question, but also gives a little Mm. bit more. There's been a good bit of talk over the last six years about narcissistic personalities. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. one of the character traits of a narcissist is they typically, in our leadership role, it's never their fault if it goes wrong. Mm. It's always (laughs) their good if it goes good. 
you know, <laughs> just say it. You find people that it's about them. Mm-hmm. It's about their success. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with people under them being successful. Mm-hmm. They typically are bullies. Uh, there's a whole long list, yeah. and I won't get into the psychological, yeah. but those people may get the business, let's say, mm-hmm. or the church to a destination they want. Mm. But once you get there, are the people on the bus still alive? Did, did the wheels <laughs> fall off on the way there? Yeah, is it just you in the driver's seat and the rest of the bus is, you know? Love it. Dub, we're going to go ahead and pause the recording. Good. Our guest today has been Dr. Dub Darville, accounting professor and person of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Dub. <laughs> yep. Life is way too short for work to suck. So if you want help to build your team, train your team, or manage your team, we're here. Come see us at WorkplaySolutions.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast.